The human brain evolved in an environment where resources were always scarce. Food, useful equipment and information were limited from the beginning of history up to the Industrial Revolution. This made our human tendency to overconsume and always striving for more, an evolutionary edge. But today, in a world of abundance, this primitive part of our brain is causing us significant trouble. In this summary, we'll explore how to leverage what the author calls the scarcity loop to enhance our lives instead of ruining them. This is Detox Dan presenting my top four takeaways of Michael Easter's Scarcity Brain. Takeaway number one, the scarcity loop. The scarcity loop consists of three stages, opportunity, unpredictable rewards, and quick repeatability. It seems to be the best way to hook human beings to continue any desired behavior. Let's take a slot machine, for example. The opportunity is to win, say, a big jackpot, or lose the money you bet. The unpredictable reward is when you wait in excitement to see whether the symbols will align in your favor. Quick repeatability means that you can hit that spin button again the second you lost the last spin. The reason this hooks us so much is because it is very similar to a game we used to play back in the day, called hunting. First, we had the opportunity to find food for the day, or even the month, perhaps. Then we went out looking over the next horizon to see if there were some trees with fruits on them, or a pack of zebras. Afterwards, we could repeat this action over and over again, although the repeatability might not seem that quick compared to the slot machine. And perhaps that is part of the problem. This mechanism, the scarcity loop, is so powerful and deeply encoded in our reptile brain that it even works on pigeons. When given two choices, a pigeon in a box will almost always peck at a lever that gives him food at a random interval over a predictable interval, even if the random one gives much less food in total. That is crazy! However, I will come back to these pigeons later as they might teach us the most fundamental way to break out of this addiction as well. Now, it should start to make sense why this loop can be dangerous if leveraged against us. More industries are building their models based on this loop and speeding things up, like one-click buying for shopping and autoplay for Netflix watching. If we are unconscious about this, it will most certainly lead to undesired overconsumption. Let's see if we can use this loop to enhance our lives instead. Takeaway number two, breaking the cycle. There are three main reasons why someone stuck in the scarcity loop quits a behavior. First, the opportunity could go away. Second, the reward can stop coming. Third, the repetition gets slower. The author, for example, decided to lose some weight inspired by a healthy tribe he lived with in the jungle. His plan was to eat only one ingredient foods. Therefore, he threw all the unhealthy ultra-processed and sugary foods out. The opportunity for snacking went away. There were also no more unpredictable rewards, in the form of satisfying food textures and sugar spikes. He lost 5 pounds in a month. Another more exciting way to leverage this loop is not to break out of it at all but instead replace the rewards with real-life things that are good for us. A really cool example of this was the fiend on Pokemon Go. People hooked to the scarcity loop of gaming were now running around in the forest, excited whether some rare Pokemon might be at the next hill. Opportunity, unpredictable rewards, quick repeatability. The game raked up more than 10 billion miles of walking. Now, Let's revisit the degenerate gambling pigeons in the box I mentioned before. Turns out, if you let them live in a really nice pigeon environment instead, with lots of pigeon friends and fun trees to hang out in, they stop pecking at the gambling food lever. They get their stimuli from real life instead, and choose the more rational lever that delivers more food but at a predictable interval. Both animals and humans seem to have a baseline for enough stimuli, and the goal is to hit that threshold through healthy activities. That's the real takeaway here. Structuring your life in a way that is fulfilling enough that these short-term dopamine spikes from swiping, shopping, etc. don't do much for you anymore. Takeaway number three. 
Ora et Labora. Michael went to a Benedict Cloister to come face to face with a group of people who seem to have nailed this enough concept. Although modern research suggests that we are getting unhappier with each generation, these monks were completely content with life. They believed you should have enough to meet your own needs, but nothing in excess. It goes for food, possessions, influence, and so on. Their motto, Ora et Labora, means pray and work. And their attitude to their work is vastly different than the common 9 to fivers. First of all, they believe idleness is the enemy of the soul. Therefore, they are happy to do any hard work that is demanded, without needing anything more than the intrinsic reward of contributing to society. Work becomes a spiritual practice, instead of a means to an end. They also believed in working a sustainable number of hours. Praying and resting were high priorities on their schedules. This makes a lot of sense, as many people now argue that four hours a day is the sweet spot for productivity. For example, in a study about researchers' productivity, the 20 hours a week group produced the most scientific papers. Many of our greatest thinkers lived by this rule, like Charles Darwin, Ingmar Bergman, and G. H. Hardy. The latter, one of the best mathematicians in history, said, four hours of creating work a day is the limit. This chapter inspired me greatly and awoke a forgotten dimension in my own grind. I now, at least temporarily, view it as my obligation to the universe to sit down and produce work at the best of my ability for a healthy number of hours each day. And I can feel how getting into flow states also has a spiritual element. Takeaway number four, information. Humans are driven to explore. It is in our DNA. We crave it on a similar level as food and sex. I really love this trait about us. Give us some planks and nails, and we just can't help but to try to row across dangerous water to find a new continent. And it makes sense. Information has always been crucial for our survival. The one who knew the most places with easy access food and solid shelters were most likely to survive. Thus, Information is also tightly linked to the scarcity loop. If used in the wrong way, the hunt for information can backfire now that we live in an excess of information. Some scientists argue that we now consume more information through news sites and social media in one given day than someone in the Middle Ages did during their whole life. Think about that. The big issue with information is that more dramatic and negative news capture our attention better. This leads to a negativity bias in the news and gives us a skewed view of the world. Also, more polarizing news are rewarded, which might lead to increased political division and the creation of deep social and ideological gaps. On the flip side, information and exploration is great for us. Research shows, for example, that toddlers who are allowed to explore the world develop their brains faster and build stronger immune systems. It also shows that anyone can increase their creativity and concentration by walking while paying open attention to the world around them. And of course, information can also be very useful as good advice might increase the quality of your life, which I hope this video did. If so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next video.